The Kevin Willard era of Maryland men's basketball is underway, and we'll have a live update from Xfinity Center. Maryland football struggles in the month of November continue, and two fall teams are gearing up for the NCAA tournament. All that and more coming up on the left bench. That's what we've tried to build this team for to manage it, and we didn't do a great job of it today. It was a great feeling. You know, I'm, I'm proud of this team. I'm proud of this staff. Well, thanks so much for joining us here on the Left Bench. I'm Kevin McNulty. That's Kira Bruno. And Kira, it's the season of giving. And in this case, it means that Maryland sports are giving us a lot to talk about. Yeah, you mentioned that right in the intro. And we've got Big Ten and NCAA tournaments happening here in College Park this week. And football only has three games left in its regular season. But most importantly, basketball is back. And that's where we'll start today. Ricky Podgorski joins us from Xfinity Center. And Maryland men's basketball started its season with a win over Niagara. Ricky, it's the first game of the Kevin Willard era. And what were your impressions of Willard's debut and the team that we are going to see this season? Yeah, guys, head coach Kevin Willard got the win here on opening night. The biggest difference and shocker to me was the defensive strategy that Willard put out. He put out a lot of different strategies, especially a full court pressure, 2-2-1 trapping defense. He's played a lot of man-to-man, -man, half court defense. A lot of his defensive strategy was to compensate for a lack of size and, and growth on the, on, the def on the defensive side. But switching offensively, Dante Scott was the X factor tonight. He tallied in 18 points tonight, seven rebounds. He was four for five from three point range. He was the X factor. He's really gonna have to step up this year to be that leader and that, and, and that, that main man in the locker room this year. So Ricky, you mentioned there at the end about Dante Scott and a little later, we're gonna talk about if we think he's gonna lead the team in points per game this year. So based off of tonight's performance, what's your answer to that question and kind of a little more about his performance? At this rate, Dante Scott is going to be a Big Ten all first first team player. Uh, Kevin Willard just mentioned a few minutes ago how he thinks that Dante Scott will be one of those players. He put in four for five, like I mentioned, from three-point range. He was shooting lights out. You can definitely see that off-season work that he's been putting in, paying off in the big time under the lights. But it's his supported cast that's going to help him out. Jameer Young really controlling the pace is that point guard, Nakeem Hart, finding Dante Scott out in the open. So the whole cast is going to have to come together as a whole for Dante Scott to perform like he, he did here tonight. But 18 points is not a bad time and a bad score for his debut. Yeah, we'll see what they can do. Quick turnaround. They're back in action on Thursday on that same floor you're standing on right now. Ricky, thanks so much for joining the show and giving us a report in Kevin Willard's College Park debut. Thank you, guys. And Kevin, I think it's important to know that at halftime, it was only a seven-point difference between the teams. So with the Terps coming back around 22 points at the end there, We'll see how they end up doing the rest of the season. Yeah, they didn't look great there in the first half. I know Kevin Willard said after the game that he might want to switch up some of the lineups that he trotted out there, so we'll see if he does that on Thursday. But Willard's squad isn't the only basketball team in town. The Maryland women's basketball season is also underway, and their record is also 1-0. Alexa Wooten joins us from Eagle Bank Arena in Fairfax, Virginia, where the Terps took down George Mason 88-51 in their season opener. Alexa, there are a lot of new faces on Brenda Fries' roster. How did they look in game one? Yeah, Kevin, Kira, the Terps had a great start to their season as they defeated the George Mason Patriots. However, the big story tonight was Diamond Miller. She went down in the second quarter after having 11 points in the first quarter. And Fries said after the game that it was a precautionary measure and they just didn't want to push Miller with so much of the season ahead. However, she did say she was pleased to see that many of the new faces for her team this year stepped up to create a great team win. I mean, Abby Myers, she shot 55% from the three-point line and 49% from the field. You also had Bree McDaniels, a freshman with 13 points, and Lavender Briggs with the highest plus minus with eight rebounds. The Terps just all together, they played a great team game, which led to a great team win. Well, Alexa, a lot of fans are curious to know 
Is this team ready for South Carolina on Friday? The defending national champs come to town on Friday, the second game of the season. Will Maryland have enough to take down the Gamecocks? I mean, Kevin, it's going to be a big test. They definitely had a good game tonight. They played good on defense, having a lot of active activity on it, holding George Mason to only 29% from the field. As well, they shot really well as a team on the three-point line and moved the ball well as a team. The question will be, though, if they can fill the gaps on their defense, which they did see a little bit tonight, and can score against South Carolina's hard defensive end. Well, Alexa, great to hear from you. Thanks for being there in Fairfax tonight. Uh, great uh, to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And as we just mentioned, the road for the Terps gets a whole lot tougher because the defending NCAA champs are coming to town. Maryland will host South Carolina on Friday right here in College Park for their home opener. The annual matchup with the Gamecocks is always a must-watch thanks to both teams' stack rosters and lauded head coaches. They started facing off consistently back in 2017, and South Carolina has won each installment with the exception of Maryland's 85-61 win in 2018. And the last matchup between the two teams took place last December, and South Carolina barely escaped with a seven-point victory over the shorthanded Terps. And with a new look starting lineup, it will be interesting to see if Brenda Fries and her squad show up against the top-ranked Gamecocks. Well, since winter sports are already in motion here in College Park, you might be wondering who the impact players will be for each team. Jonas Evans is here to give us his winter sports X-Factors, and I have a feeling who he might single out on that women's basketball squad. Jonas? Yeah, Kara, you're probably right. These are the difference makers on these teams. And let's start with Maryland's women's basketball team. This is a squad that lost a lot of key contributors from last season, but not everyone. Guard Diamond Miller is staying at College Park to play her senior season for the Terps, and this year she's this team's X Factor. Miller is going to be important to this team in multiple ways this season. First off, she's an incredible scorer. With a beautiful high arc and jump shot, smooth handles, and elite finishing, she's going to be a weapon for the Terps offensively. Miller averaged 13.1 points last season, even with all that scoring ability on the rest of the roster. She managed to make all Big Ten second team last year, even after missing 10 of the first 12 games. And just as importantly, Miller brings tremendous experience to a team going through a lot of changes this season. That leadership role is going to be just as important as the scoring this season. Now let's move on to the Maryland men's basketball team, a program that's going through a lot of changes going into this season. First year head coach Kevin Willard will need great play from everyone on this roster, but to make the X factor who will make all the difference this season is center Julian Reese. With Caduce Wahab back at Georgetown, Reese will be Maryland's starting center in his sophomore season. The Terps were out-rebounded and out-blocked by Big Ten opponents last year, and it will be up to Reese to improve that. Standing at 6'9", Reese can be a weapon for the Terps on both ends of the floor. He's versatile with great interior play and blocking ability, as well as a jump shot that he can make from anywhere on the court. Reese has arguably the most potential out of any player on this team, and if the Terps are going to perform well this season, their second-year big man will have to contribute in a major way. Let's move on to Maryland Wrestling, a program that's seen major improvements in recent seasons. Last year, the Terps won the most matches in a season since 2014, and they've started out hot this year with a 3-0 start. A major part of this recent success is their heavyweight wrestler and X-Factor, Jaron Smith. Incredibly, Smith is entering his eighth season with the Terps. This year, he's in the heavyweight division, taking over for Zach Schrader, who was the Terps' closer last year. With his eight years of experience, Smith brings leadership, intensity, and most importantly, wins. He's ranked 27th in the country in his weight class, the highest of anyone on the team, and has won all three of his matches this season with his strength, technical ability, and incredible energy that always gets the crowd excited. Jaron Smith is the core of this team. Finally, there's Maryland Gymnastics, a team with a big hole to fill this season. The Terps lost their highest scoring gymnast in Maryland history with the departure of Audrey Barber. There's no doubt that the X factor for this te year's team will be whoever has the tough task of filling Barber's shoes. This season, it's senior Emma Silberman. It's a tough task to follow up arguably the best gymnast in program history, but Silberman has the versatility to do so. Last season, Silberman was the only Terp alongside Barber to participate in all four events for Maryland. Silberman's consistency is her strength, but she also showed flashes of pure brilliance last year, highlighted by her 9.95 in the bars that tied a program record. And guys, a big theme to note with all four of these players is stepping up, filling shoes. These, a lot of these teams lost key players that these players are going to have uh, to step up for. Yeah, that's what 
Emma Silberman will have to do for Maryland Gymnastics for sure. Silberman's a player I covered pretty closely three years ago. She's dealt with some injuries over the course of her career, but she's set up for a strong senior campaign. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how Julian Reese does in this starting center position with Kudus Wahab gone. He definitely has some shoes to fill. Yep. But Jonas, thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks, Jonas. And Kevin, this is the first time we've waited this long to talk about Maryland football, but after this past weekend, there's not really much to talk about. Yeah, the weather was pretty messy up there in Madison this weekend, and somehow Maryland's offense was even messier. Maryland traveled to southern Wisconsin this weekend, hoping to equal last year's win total ahead of back-to-back -back top 15 matchups with Penn State and Ohio State. But that is not what happened. The weather in Madison certainly played a major role in this one, as the elements forced both teams to rely heavily on the run game. And Wisconsin found success with that strategy early. Braylon Allen gave the Badgers an early 7-0 lead with a 9-yard score. But the biggest run for the Badgers came in the second quarter. Allen's running mate Isaac Garendo weaved his way through the Maryland defense and showed his tiptoe skills down the sideline on the way to an 89-yard score, one that the Terps couldn't recover from. The combination of defensive struggles early and the weather added to the pressure for Talia Tungavailoa. It was his return from injury and it didn't go well. Between the wet ball, bad snaps, and lack of help from his blockers, Leah never fell into a rhythm and struggled to get anything going in the passing game. He was sacked five times on the day, going 10 of 23 for just 77 yards, including a garbage time touchdown and a pick. Everything that could have gone wrong for the Terps offense went wrong. And for the first time this season, Maryland scored less than 27 points. The 23-10 loss moved Maryland to 6-3 on the season, with three regular season games remaining. I thought they took advantage of the elements a little better than we did, and, and to me, I've got to get our team ready to play regardless of what happens. This is, you're in the Big Ten, you're going to have rain, you're going to have wetness, you're going to have wind, and that's what we've tried to build this team for to manage it, and we didn't do a great job of it today. Maryland will head up to Happy Valley Saturday for a contest against another fierce foe, the Penn State Nittany Lions. Coming off a crushing 45-14 victory against Indiana, Penn State will be looking to ball out again, especially with the way Maryland played against Wisconsin. But it shouldn't be an easy win for either team. The Nittany Lions suffered a big loss at Michigan, 41-17, and when the Terps were at the big house, it was a much different game, only losing by one touchdown. Another mutual opponent thus far was Purdue, which was a devastating home loss for Maryland. Penn State also played a close game with them, but they were able to snag that week one win, 35-31. And the Nittany Lions have been dominant against Maryland for as long as anyone can remember, winning 41 out of the 44 games. Ricky Podgorski and I will be at Beaver Stadium on Saturday to catch all of the action. Well, Maryland Volleyball came into Sunday afternoon's matchup with Iowa at 0-6 at home in the Big Ten, but that changed with a 3-1 win. The Terps weren't phased after they dropped the first set 25-21. They came roaring back with three straight set wins. And it was Layla Ivey's career day. She totaled 18 kills and a block, and combined with Sam Sire's 13 kills, that was too much for the Hawkeyes. It only took four sets, and the fourth set even went into overtime. It was a 27-25 victory for the Terps to take home their first conference win at home. And Adam Hughes was loving the atmosphere in the pavilion. A little late, but uh, it was. Uh, I'm glad we got it. I'm glad uh, Coach Willard was there eating some popcorn in the far corner. I wanted to make sure I didn't choke Maggie, and, tell him to and, and blow that, uh, that lead away. I prompter, saw him uh, cheering, so it was nice to have him in the building. And, Maggie, uh, yeah, we're just happy to be at home. It was great to have the full band there. It made a huge difference and it was loud. And, and uh, you know, that's the atmosphere we want to build. And just happy we were able to get the win for everybody. And keep it right here because when we come back, we'll break down an exciting Big Ten tournament run for one Maryland team and a dev devastating end to one for another. And later, Kevin and I will be going to the polls. Don't go anywhere. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. 
Hey there, and welcome back to The Left Bench. I'm Kira Bruno, joined alongside by Kevin McNulty. And folks, it's postseason time for a pair of teams here in College Park. Yeah, that's right, Kira. And can you believe it's been six years since Maryland men's soccer took home the Big Ten regular season crown? I know, I can't even believe it. Hard, hard to believe when you think about the fact that they've won a national championship during that span. Well, the Terps punched their ticket to the Big Ten semifinals, earning redemption against eighth-seeded Northwestern, making up for their heartbreaking loss in the tournament last year. Maryland started out slow, allowing multiple shots on goal, but stellar play from Niklas Neumann, including this spectacular save, kept the teams even. The Terps had their opportunities to take the lead, but they just could not find the back of the net. Their first major chance came when Joshua Bulma was fouled in the box. Malcolm Johnston, who has been perfect from penalties this season, hit the crossbar. Maryland was awarded a second penalty, this time taken by Joshua Bulma, but his shot went straight to the keeper. The Terps finally put it together on offense after Malcolm Johnston found the foot of Colin Griffith, scoring the lone goal of the game. The defense stepped up in the second half, allowing for zero shots on goal and pushing the Terps to the Big Ten semifinals. To find a way to get a result. Um, you know, we um, got off to a little bit of a slow start. Um, you know, Northwestern did a good job of disrupting our, our game. We grew into the game. And I thought that in the second part of the first half, we started to take control. But the second half was all us. That was more like Maryland soccer. The Big Ten champs have certainly been bolstered by the play of fifth-year senior Nick Richardson this season, who's lighting up college soccer. The right back has notched three goals and seven assists so far, making his final year in College Park his best one yet. Alexa Wooten explains how his years of hard work are finally paying off. This is the best year he's had in his career this year. He's been phenomenal. Nick Richardson is going out with a bang, as his final season in College Park has been his best one yet. A fifth-year captain for the Terps, Nick is seeing a flood of recognition pour in. From being named the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Week, to the Top Drawer Soccer Team of the Week, to the College Soccer News Team of the Week, and all Big Ten First Team. But while he appreciates all the recognition, for Nick, it's still all about the team. Nick has been a vital member of the Maryland men's soccer program since that 2018 National Championship team, playing all over the field for the Terps. The summer coming into his freshman year, Nick suffered an injury and had to redshirt. Throughout his time at Maryland, Nick has had some residual pain in his knee. So coming into his final year, he made sure to put the work in. And, uh, this past spring and summer, he really spent so much more time in the weight room, took care of his body, got physically stronger. And this year he's had no pain and he's, he's playing 90 minutes a game. He's been just fantastic. So it's the first season, I think, where he's played from beginning to end. Um, free of pain and you can see the results. Nick has been a symbol of hard work since he stepped foot in College Park, constantly doing the little things to make himself and the team better. It, you wouldn't know how much work he puts in off the field until obviously now he's getting recognition, but he's been doing that for as long as I've known him. And it's really, it really shows how committed he is to the game and how committed he is to making himself better, which makes the team better. A strong and vocal leader and a fierce competitor, Nick is seeing his hard work finally pay off. Nick notched his first ever collegiate goal this season against Georgetown. Uh, it was awesome. It was kind of a little relief off my shoulders. Um, for that, nothing seemed to really go in, so it was an awesome feeling. Nick helped lead his team in earning the 2022 Big Ten regular season championship title. And as the Terps enter into the postseason, Nick looks to end his career the same way he started it, with a national championship. Oh, just I love him. I, I love Nick Richardson. I, I think it's, it's players like Nick that make your job so rewarding here. Um, he's, he's, he's a gem. He's just, he's, he's a Mr. Maryland soccer kind of kid. I love him. For Terrapin Sports Central, I'm Alexa Wooten. Our thanks yet again to Alexa and Kira. I mean, Nick Richardson, a guy who had to sit and watch his team win the national championship four years ago, now in his fifth year, really showing up. Three goals this season, hadn't had a goal coming into this year. He wants it bad, you can tell. Yeah, definitely. And Sasha said at the end there, he's just a gem, Mr. Maryland soccer. And like you said, he's definitely showing that. But unfortunately, number two Maryland field hockey's outcome looked different in their Big Ten tournament, with it ending in a devastating semifinal loss to number four Northwestern 2-1. to one. Despite it being a low-scoring match, the intensity was there on both sides of the ball. 
Northwestern earned both their goals off a pair of penalty corners in the first half, but Maryland cut that deficit in half with a late goal from Hope Rose in the third quarter. It was enough to keep the offensive pressure up, but not enough to find that equalizing goal. Goalie Christina Calandra had a career-high seven saves to keep the Terps in a close game. Maryland will now start the, their NCAA tournament run on Friday against the team that kicked them out of the tournament last year, Liberty University, right here in College Park. And that game against Liberty will take place here in College Park on Friday at noon. And they have to go up against the defending runners-up right after losing to the defending national champions in the Big Ten tournament. A tough task, but you know Missy Mihargs is going to have them ready. And both field hockey and men's soccer have racked up all Big Ten honors at the end of the regular season. Our Matthew News is here with more. Matt? That's right, guys. End of the regular season, one thing that means award season for the Big Ten. Sasha Swarovski preaches excellence, and, that's, and it's safe to say that that is reflected in the Big Ten end-of-season honors for men's soccer. Joshua Bulma, Malcolm Johnson, and the defensive duo in Chris Rindov and Nick Richardson were all named to the All-Big Ten first team. Bulma is having his best season so far in College Park. The redshirt sophomore has tallied two goals and added a career-high seven assists so far this season. Johnson is also having a career-high season. The senior midfielder has contributed five goals and five assists, both career highs, including the game-winning assist to Colin Griffith to see the Terps advance past Northwestern in the first round of the Big Ten tournament. And the two rocks on the back line, Rindov and Richardson, both find themselves having a stellar final year here at Maryland. Richardson has scored three goals this campaign, which included his first-ever collegiate goal against Georgetown, and has added seven assists. Rindov has put the ball in the back of the net twice this season, including a goal in the Terps' 6-1 route of rival UVA in D.C., and has one assist to his name as well. The pair have combined for four clean sheets this season. And it wouldn't be the end of the season awards without mentioning Coach Sorovsky. Sorovsky has won the Big Ten Coach of the Year for the second time, making that five ACC and Big Ten Coach of the Year awards combined for the three-time national champion. And while men's soccer racked up awards, Maryland field hockey also racked up multiple Big Ten end-of-season awards. Emma DeBerdine and Danielle Van Rutselaar were both named to the All-Big Ten first team. DeBerdine has scored five goals and added four assists this season for the Terps. This is DeBerdine's second selection to the All-Big Ten first team, with her first selection coming back in 2019. The Brown transfer Van Rutselaar was a unanimous pick for the All-Big Ten first team, scoring seven goals in just 14 games for Maryland, with two of those goals being overtime winners. She has also added one assist this season. And being named to the All-Big Ten second team was Hope Rose and Leah Krause. Rose was named to the second team for the second time after contributing 12 goals and 8 assists. Krause, another grad transfer, has had an instant impact in her only season at Maryland. The Duke transfer has scored nine times this season, with five of those goals being game winners, a team high. Now, guys, with men's soccer and field hockey wrapping up their seasons, uh, football has a couple games left. I wonder if any of those football players can get onto those end-of-season awards. Yeah, that's exactly right. You mentioned those last th three games left for the football team, so it's going to be something to look out for to see if any of those star players on the team can grab some awards. I think Loxley had a case for Coach of the Year at the beginning of the season. That's not really the case anymore, but Roman Hemby still has a shot at Big Ten Freshman of the Year. Thanks so much, Matt. Anytime. And Maryland Wrestling opened its season with a sweep in a home quad meet on Saturday. They had wins over Bloomsburg, Duke, which always excites Maryland fans, and American in the finale. The Terps opened the day in the morning with a 37-6 win over Bloomsburg. Then came the big-time sweep over Duke. 37-0 the Terps won, but they still had another team to face off against. And that was American, where they squeezed by with a 29-10 win. Braxton Brown, Cal and Ethan Miller, Michael North, Dominic Solis, Jackson, and Jaron Smith all opened their seasons with 3-0 starts in individual bouts. I mean, they're talented, and they competed like they're talented. I, you know, one of them said to me, he turned and said, Coach, I think we're pretty good. And I said, I think we're okay. I, just, I think we're okay. I don't think we're good. What they, they have a lot of work to do. They're just young. They just they haven't been in wars. They haven't been in a hostile environment. They haven't been in, you know, 10 heaters back to back to back to back to back. Um, we'll, we'll get that soon enough. Now, don't go anywhere because when we return, we'll be joined by Alex Gary to cast our votes for a few Maryland sports referendums. Can't wait for that. And as always, we'll crown our Terp of the Week, Pro Terp, and Top 5 Plays of the Week. Stay with us. 
there are so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. You know, it took 20 years, and I got my third child, who was 17 at the time. It's so cool to watch the adult that you've become, and you really have done as much for us as you think we've done for you. Welcome back to The Left Bench, and since it's Election Day in the U.S., we've decided con to conduct our own sort of elections with Maryland Sports, of course. And to do that, we brought on our friend Alex Gary. I guess he's the elections committee for <laughs> this episode of The Left Bench, and he has five referendums for us to vote yes or no on. Thanks so much for being here, Al. Thanks, guys. I'm really excited about these questions, so let's just get right into them. All right, here we go. So first off, do we think Maryland field hockey will reach the Final Four this season? I'm going to go with a yes on this one. This has been a phenomenal team so far this season with an elite lineup, 17-3 and overall in the season. So I think they can definitely make it to their second Final Four in a row. Obviously, it's been a great year for field hockey so far. That loss against Northwestern in the Big Ten tournament scares me. I'm voting no. Maryland field hockey does not go back to the Final Four for the second year in a row. It will be a tough task with Liberty in the first round of the NCAA tournament. I'm not saying they can't do it. I just think somewhere along the line they slip up and that offense disappears again like it did against Northwestern. I'm going to side with Kira on this one. I mean, Maryland's a top-scoring offense in the NCAA for a reason, so I don't see why they can't see similar production in the NCAA tournament. So on to the next question. Men's soccer, huge story this uh, week. Will Maryland men's soccer win the Big Ten tournament title? Now this one I'm switching up on, and I'm saying yes. Maryland men's soccer wins two Big Ten championships here in 2022 with the Big Ten regular season title, which they already won last week. Now two more games to get the Big Ten tournament crown. What an accomplishment that would be for Sasha Swarovski's squad after the disappointing end to the season last year in the Big Ten tournament and the NCAA tournament. I'm saying, yes, they get it done. Two Big Ten championships for men's soccer this fall. I'm also going to go on yes with this one. They're the first seed in the tournament, and Indiana might be a little tough, but I think they can pull it off. And then also Ohio State and Rutgers, they beat them previously, so I think they can get it done. Well, I'm going to go with the sweep here. I'm also going to say yes. The Terps have struggled a little bit offensively in the past couple games, but the chances have been there. And Sasho, he's also been there. So I don't see why they can't fix up these mistakes put a couple more in the net en route to a Big Ten championship. Now, moving on to the winter sports. Do we see Maryland women's basketball defeating powerhouse teams like UConn or South Carolina? I'm going to go with no on this one, unfortunately. I just think the matchups with South Carolina, they've been pretty close the last few years, especially with that only seven-point difference last year, but huge powerhouse defending national champions, and then UConn's also a huge powerhouse. I'm going to have to go with no on this one. Yeah, we talked about the matchup this Friday against South Carolina. Dawn Staley coach team, that's a tough task. And then you have UConn. It's UConn women's basketball. Obviously, Maryland is a great program, but I don't think they get it done against either of those teams. I'm voting no. This was one of those elections where I want to check yes so bad. I want it for that team, but I don't think they can get it done. With all the new faces they have, it's going to be a learning curve through the non-conference season. And that's why Brenda Fries schedules these tough games against the two best teams from last year, UConn and South Carolina. I'm saying no, they don't get it done, but they're going to learn from it, and they're going to be really well-suited once they start the Big Ten season. I mean, I hate to do it too, but I'm also going to have to check no on this one. It doesn't help that the second game of the season for this fairly new squad is against the defending national champions in South Carolina. That's never an easy feat. And UConn, again, a powerhouse of a team. I don't know if the Terps are going to be able to get it done. Moving on to the men's side, do we see Dante Scott leading the Terps in points per game? This one, I am voting yes. And through one game, I am right, because Dante Scott was the leading scorer Monday against Niagara. I mean, Dante Scott is a guy who has been with the program for four years now. Kevin Willard said that he has been a vocal leader in the locker room since he arrived here seven months ago. I think Scott is the clear leader of this team, and he's going to show it on the stat sheet as well. I'm voting yes. Dante Scott is the Terps' leading scorer in 22-23. I'm also going with yes on this one. He was third on the team last year in points per game behind Fats Russell and Eric Ayala, and both of those guys are gone. And 
like you said, he's now a leader on this team, so I think he could definitely get it done too. I'm going to change things up a little bit. I'm going to say no, and I'm going to say Jameer Young, the new face, will lead the Terps in uh, points per game. He's a new transfer, a top transfer, to be fair, and he averaged 16.7 points at Charlotte, and I don't see why I can see similar production on the Terps. Now, he's not a, as much of a leader as Dante is, but I don't see how he can't make it to the basket this much this season. Yeah, Akeem Hart, another guy to look out for. Obviously, been with the team as long as Dante Scott has, but how scary going with the third-party candidate, I guess you would, <laughs> in this election with Jameer Young. Yeah, and switching things back up to the fall sports, do we see Maryland football reaching that eight-win mark this season? Another tough one, but I'm going to say yes. They get there, and we have to look at the slate for football the rest of the way, right? They have Penn State in Beaver Stadium this weekend. Then they're home for Ohio State. I think those might both be losses. But then Rutgers to close out the season, which is a gift from the Big Ten Scheduling Committee. So one and two to close out the regular season. Seven and five going into a bowl. I think they get their eighth win in a bowl game this year. I'm voting yes, but it happens in crunch time. Yeah, kind of going off of that, I'm a little bit 50-50, but I think I'm going to head with no on this one just because the way they played against, against Wisconsin and playing like that, going into Penn State, huge team. And then if they lose that one, Ohio State, obviously that's going to be a really, really tough one. And then Rutgers, like you said, that should be a win. So we'll just have to see how it pans out. I'm going to have to say no on this one as well. I mean, it was a tough pill to swallow that last game against Wisconsin. The Terps just had nothing going for them. And heading into Penn State, playing any team playing in Penn State is always difficult. That stadium is a tough place to play. And then follow that up with an Ohio State team that seems like they're national championship bound. It's a tough run of things. Rutgers is 50-50 after Terps have a tough couple of games. I want to say that it happens, but realistically, I don't know if that will be the case. Yeah, a little bit of recency bias over here from <laughs> these two. Well, Alex, thanks so much for coming in. That was a lot of fun. Always a pleasure, guys. So, and after you hit the polls today, be sure to vote on our Maryland sports referendums on Twitter at Terp Central. And now to switch things up, it's time to hand out our Terp of the Week, Pro Terp, and Top 5 Play Honors. Starting with our Terp of the Week, Colin Griffith. Griffith's stellar freshman campaign continued Friday night when he punched in the lone goal of Maryland's 1-0 win over Northwestern. The big-time goal was the freshman's second of the year, and this is his first time being named our Terp of the Week. Congratulations to Colin. New place, new time zone, new team, but that's no issue for this week's pro Terp, Kevin Herter. It's, it certainly hasn't been difficult for Herter to adjust to his new role. With five games under his belt for the Sacramento Kings, he's already averaging 17.6 points per game. In his second game alone, he dropped 27 points and seven three-pointers for an 87.5 three-point percentage. And in October, Herter had the highest three-point percentage in the NBA with more than 40 attempts made. Herter has already been a standout this season, so we can't wait to see what else he has in store. Congrats to Kevin on being crowned our Pro Terp. All right, and let's, with that, we're now going into our top five plays for this week. Kevin, start us off. All right, Kira, I heard we have some bangers in here. Jaron Smith in his eighth year in College Park. Are you kidding me? Takedown against Duke, Maryland over Duke. Once again, this time at the Xfinity Center Pavilion. Great job by Smith. And next up, we have Hope Rose's goal in the third quarter, hoping for that offensive pressure to equalize that, but unfortunately, they couldn't get it done. And we'll stay with field hockey. Christina Calandra with a huge save against Northwestern in the tournament. That kept the game at 2-1. to one. Terps weren't able to score and tie things up. And at number two, we have Layla Ivy's huge kill versus Iowa. Look at how she hit that ball. Beautiful. Number one, we just watched it. Colin Griffith, are you serious? Only his second goal of the year. Maryland needed that one after two big missed opportunities. But wow, what a goal from Griffith. A lot of fun, a lot of hype around Maryland men's soccer right now. Oh yeah, huge goal and lots of hype for Maryland men's soccer. You're right on that. Well, that's going to do it for this edition on the left bench. Nathan Schwartz and Jonas Evans will be behind the desk next week to fill you in on Maryland volleyball on the left bench in focus. And be sure to keep up with all of our coverage on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and online at TerrapinSportsCentral.com. We'll see you next time.